Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, and this is a talk called How Rust Views Tradeoffs. Um, I uh, am on the Rust core team. Uh, I'm currently in between jobs. I used to work at Mozilla on Rust, but have recently left. And I don't know exactly what I'm doing yet. We'll see what happens. But uh, I'm still going to be heavily involved in Rust development, even though it's not my day job anymore. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, cool. All right, I guess I got to click. Um, so this is a little overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this is the like choose the right language for the job track. And so I wanted to talk about like how Rust views trade-offs and the way that they like what, what would make you choose Rust or not, and also just some ideas when you think about um, trade-offs. So we're going to start off by talking about what even is a trade-off in the first place. Um, and then we're going to talk about Rust's bending the curve philosophy. And I will, it's how Rust approaches thinking about trade-offs. So we got to talk about that first. Um, and then we're going to go into a small digression about how things get designed in the first place um, and this concept of values. And then lastly, we're going to go over these uh, four different sort of case studies in areas where Rust has had to choose some sort of trade-off and why we picked the thing that we did um, and the thing that we didn't do and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah. All right, briefly, before I get into the rest of the talk, I want to thank Brian Cantrell. Um, a large part of this talk is sort of based on a framework that he came up with. Uh, there's this talk called Platform as a Reflection of Values from Node Summit 2017. And it's kind of about the story of Joyent and Node and IOJS and all that stuff. And he's the one that really got me thinking about a lot of the stuff that ends up being in this talk. So I wanted to make sure to give him credit. So you should, you should watch this talk. It's good. Um, OK, so uh, before we talk about trade-offs, it's important that we all agree like what a trade-off actually is. Um, I am like an amateur philosophy uh, enthusiast, and one of the hardest problems when communicating with others is making sure that you're not talking past each other. You have to kind of you have to agree what words mean by using words, uh, which is like complicated. So uh, so we're gonna get into what trade-offs are before we talk about the specific trade-offs um, in Rust. So uh, everyone always does this, and it's kind of boring and dumb, and I apologize. But uh, the dictionary defines trade-off. This is a little more interesting, I, I swear. Um, a balance achieved by, between two desirable but incompatible features, or a compromise. Now, the first thing is interesting, I think, is the sentence, uh, a trade-off between objectivity and relevance. That's kind of like an interesting example of a trade-off. Like, you can be objective or relevant. So like, <laughs> you have to be subjective to apply to reality. Like, I might agree with that a little more, but the reason I decided to put this on the slide is not because like, you know, the dictionary says it's such a dumb meme, but the thing right below this on the web page, if you Google this, and I thought this was really interesting, um, is this use over time graph. And I was like, wait a minute, just after 1950 is the first time we thought of the concept of trade-offs? So I went into like a deep rabbit hole. You know, you're supposed to be working on slides. And instead of working on your slides, you're like, I need to look up the linguistics about the word trade-off. And it turns out the reason Cool. Uh, the reason that graph that was there uh, looked like that when you could see it uh, is because uh, <clears throat> obviously the concept of a trade-off did not start in the early 1960s, um, but it used to be the, the words trade space off, and we only started putting them together into one word around the 1960s. And so that's why this graph looks like this. Obviously, people used the words trade off and talked about discussions earlier, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. So that's why the, the dictionary thing is still up there. Uh, language changes over time, and it is cool. Um, all right. So. Um, I got a bachelor's in computer science, and one of the things that sort of beat into you, in, at least in the States, uh, is that like, there's trade-offs, and you have to deal with them. And so uh, here are three examples of like, classic trade-offs in computer science or programming that you might have dealt with um, before. So uh, one of the biggest ones is space versus time. If you like Google computer science trade-off, like everyone's like, the space-time trade-off. It's like the vast majority um, of things on the web, apparently. And the basic idea is that you can either make something fast or you can make it small. And these two things are sort of like independent of each other. Um, and so that's like a common situation um, when you're designing data structures, or talking about the network, all these kind of things. A second one is throughput versus latency. Um, and so these are two different measures of network activity. You know, throughput is like how much stuff can you do in a given space of time, and latency is like how long does it take you to do the thing. And so um, these are like two things that are often you can get good at one or not the other. 
Um, and then finally, a big classic one, uh, dynamic types versus static types. Uh, I wrote Ruby or Haskell because I was trying to think of the most trolly way to describe this description ever. Um, I actually have a Ruby tattooed on my body. I used to do Ruby before Rust and was a very dynamic typing enthusiast. Um, one of my friends, Sean Griffin, so like I've been going around for the last couple of years being like, I have a Ruby tattooed on my body. That's how much I love Ruby. My friend Sean had his firstborn daughter, and he named her Ruby. So he like one up to me. You like you think you get a tattoo and you're gonna be like the biggest thing, but I was like, fine, Sean, you win. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So dynamic versus static typing, you know, uh, and trade-offs. So these these trade-offs are are great. Uh, and complicated, and they're a core aspect of our discipline, and they're also core to another aspect of our discipline, which is arguing on the internet. Uh, people will argue over which one of these trade-offs is the right thing to choose, and like in some ways that's like kind of dumb, but also I think the trade-offs are sort of the core of what we do. If we think about programming as an engineering task, like fundamentally you have to make choices between things sometimes, um, and so that's, that's important. Um, so, uh, Rust has this interesting approach to trade-offs that we call bending the curve. Um, and this is like uh, sort of an attitude that got instilled in, in the Rust developers sort of fairly early on. I'm not really sure who started trying to think about things this way, but it's a way that we like approach the problem of like, you have these two things, what should you pick? Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit. So. Uh, when I was making these slides, I felt very clever because I looked at these three trade-offs and I was like, wait a minute, one of these trade-offs is actually different than the other two. And I don't know if you have any ideas about which one might be the, uh, the different one here, um, but I think I made a slide, since I don't have, my laptop is like totally blank, so we're gonna have a little bit of like fun, did I guess my next slide correctly? Uh, yeah, throughput versus latency. So like, this is often a function of like physics, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always a trade-off, right? Like you can sometimes have systems that are, have more throughput and less latency than a different system. It's not always inherently a trade-off. At some point, you know, uh, physics and wires and stuff I don't fully understand comes into play, but like this is an interesting entry point into this idea that like these things don't always have to be at odds with one another, even when there's a trade-off and things are usually at odds. Um, and if we think about the other ones, this also becomes kind of true. Uh, and so like, Again, these dictionary definitions, I'm sorry, bear with me briefly. Uh, this is what Wikipedia has to say, instead of the dictionary, I'll quote Wikipedia. Um, a situational decision that involves diminishing or losing one quality or whatever in return for gains in some other aspects. Basically, one thing goes down and another thing goes up. Now, if you think about this a little more generally, uh, this is sort of weird with these things I presented to you as trade-offs. Like, a lot of times, something that's smaller is actually faster. If you do like high performance computing and you can fit your computation into your like L1 cache, it becomes massively faster. And so the like what normally might be a space versus time like trade-off, so like a common thing in like compiled languages is like, do you inline a function or not? And the argument there is like, if you inline the function everywhere, your binary gets larger, so that's like a large issue, um, but you get faster. Whereas if you do dynamic dispatch instead, uh, you know, your binary is smaller because you only have one copy of the code of that function, but you end up being a little bit slower because you have to actually do the dispatch. But in other situations, like this idea with the cache, these two things aren't at odds, and in fact, smaller is often faster. This is also true, for example, um, if you've ever had to download jillions of gigabytes of JavaScript to load a web page, right? You're like, man, if this JavaScript was smaller, my page would load faster. And a lot of stuff around the web is about making things smaller so they can be faster. So sometimes this is not actually like a true dichotomy. Um, dynamic versus static typing, uh, the non trolly resolution to this is like gradual typing, right? So you can have things where you start off a little statically and you like move more dynamic or vice versa. Um, there's also, has anyone ever heard people describe dynamic languages as unityped languages before? Cool, you don't know any like functional programming troll enthusiasts then. Great, you have, you have better friends than I do. Uh, there's an argument that like all languages are statically typed because types are only a compile time construct and languages that are dynamically typed only have one type and everything is one type. So haha, you still have static types, but that's totally useless and only good for making other people mad. Um, <laughs> so gradual typing. Gradual typing is a better example of how like static versus dynamic is a real dichotomy. And in fact, even in most languages that uh, you know give you static types, there's some sort of facility for dynamic types. And we're seeing an increase in dynamic languages. Like Python is introducing this thing called MyPy, uh, which I think is in the language now um, that lets you like 
annotate functions that you want to be annotated with types, with types, and your stuff gets faster and all that goodness. So it's not exactly a pure dichotomy trade-off. And then finally, um, as I sort of already mentioned, throughput versus latency, like you can sometimes do better on both. That doesn't always mean you can, but these are like actually different measurements. Like throughput is about amount over time, and latency is about the distance to like an individual thing. So they're, it's kind of weird to even argue that they're against each other because they're just fundamentally not measuring the same thing. Um, so with this idea that like trade-offs don't have to purely be one thing goes up or goes down, like if you have two options like this or that, you see my amazing presentation drawing skills here, get ready. Uh, you know, you, we like, think that we can choose something that's like here or something that's like there and you have to pick one or the other, but in reality this is more of a gradient and so you could like, you could choose this instead, right? So it's like a little bit closer to one than the other. Um, but like bending the curve, I couldn't figure out how to draw a curve in Google Slides. Um, this is the first presentation I've used Google Slides. So bending the curve is about the idea of like, what if you could pick this instead? And so this is the best I could do with a curve. I'm sorry. Uh, I used to write all my slides in HTML and CSS and stuff, but I'm really bad at CSS, so I don't know why I kept doing that to myself. And then PDF export is terrible, and this conference loves PDFs for your slides, so like I just did Google Slides and. It's fine, whatever. But like the idea of this, like grab it in the middle and draw it up towards a different thing. Like we can we can do other stuff with trade-offs than just look at like two different options. And so we can get like unique solutions by thinking out of the box a little bit. I hope that was an enterprise enough sentence for you all. Um, and so like the way that we often think about trade-offs, as I mentioned earlier, one thing increases, another thing decreases, right? This is more commonly known um, as a zero-sum game. If you do any game theory or economic theory, apparently, according to Wikipedia. But no. Um, so like a zero-sum game basically means that like when you add up everyone's scores, they end up being zero, right? So like if, if you need to lose, then I need to win, and vice versa. Although of course I'm gonna be the one winning, right? Uh, that's the idea. And so like, but this 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 problem is that when you think this way, you start believing that other people inherently have to lose for you to win. And it turns out that like not very many things other than economic theory and game theory, which are theories, like, is this actually true? In most situations, including programming language design, uh, you can design things in a different way, and that is like a win-win game. And so this is a game in which everyone wins or everyone loses. We like to focus on the everyone wins part. And so <laughs> it's not really inherently about like you must lose so that I must win. It's about trying to figure out, is there a way that we can both win? Um, and so like a win-win strategy means that you can like, you know, try to figure out how that goes. And so this idea of bending the curve is fundamentally about when we look at trade-offs, we try to figure out a way uh, that we can have both things at the same time. Um, and so uh, this bending the curve really boils down to, yeah, like is this trade-off fundamental? Sometimes it's absolutely true. Like you, there is situations in which someone has to lose for the other person to win, but a lot of times we get too obsessed with that idea and we apply it where it doesn't have to work. And so can we like be a little creative and uh, instead, you know, have everyone win? Um, and this works way more often than you might think. Um, all right, so uh, before we get into the case studies about what Rust, what Rust actually did, so if we like, if we think about, uh, okay, this is the approach, we're gonna try to find like win-win solutions instead of you need to lose and I need to win, um, we need to talk about the game that we're actually playing. Uh, and in order to talk about that, we have to think about like the concept of design in like an abstract. Like what is the task? When I'm the person in charge of designing a language or designing a system, like what is the thing I'm even trying to do? Like what is that activity? Um, if you know any like architects, you may ask yourself, what is their job really? Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so this is the part that, that largely relies on Brian's work. Um, and so fundamentally design is about values. And so uh, when you're like thinking about a system and you're thinking about building it, you need to understand what is valuable to you. And beyond that, you really need to think about it a little more complicated than just like, what do I care about? You need to think about like, what are your core values? That is, what is the stuff you absolutely are totally not willing to give up on? Like, is there a hill that you will definitely die on and you're gonna die, uh, for sure? Um, and so like, you know, what is that stuff? But then also like secondary values. There are some things that, you know, would be nice to have, but like, if you don't get them, it'll be okay. And this is often um, you know, a little more complicated because a lot of people like to think that you, know, you can never compromise on anything. Um, and I definitely am uh, that kind of person sometimes. But like, a, lot of the, a lot of the creative process actually sticks into this like, 
when you're willing to give a little, what do you get back from it? And so having more secondary values, like you would think that having a lot of core values is very useful, but it turns out those are, those are useful in some situations, but they're not as useful as something you're actually willing to trade off for something else, right? So um, having a lot of secondary values is uh, also pretty good. And so like, what stuff do you want to have but you don't necessarily need to have? And then finally, what stuff do you just not care about whatsoever? Um, and identifying this is really important too because it means that if there's something that you do really want and you have a thing you're willing to give away, it's really easy to get that thing if you can figure out how to do that particular trade-off, right? And so being explicit about the things that you don't care about can be just as important as caring about the things you actually do care about. Um, so uh, let's talk about Rust's core values when it comes to designing things. And now, I will say that I uh, am not on the language design team uh, anymore. It's complicated. I'll get into the history a little bit later. And so this is kind of like what I see. So please take this as my personal interpretation. Obviously, Rust is designed by a lot of people. Well, maybe not obviously, but we'll talk about that later. Rust is designed by a lot of people, and so I'm not saying that they necessarily 100% agree with me. That's another funny part about design is you get to argue about things with lots of people. Um, so when I look at Rust core values, I sort of see these three things as being uh, what Rust cares about a lot. And I mentioned that they're in a particular order because the funny thing about core values is you sort of also need to decide, like, if these things come into conflict with each other, what do I actually pick? And so the thing that Rust cares about above all else is memory safety. And there is historic reasons for this, um, largely because Rust's sort of whole idea is like, what if we could make a C++ that's actually memory safe? And so if you were to give up memory safety, it'd be like, what are we, what are we doing here? Like, this is kind of, you know, like the whole point of the enterprise is, is wrong. Um, and so uh, Rust also really cares about speed, but Rust cares about safety more than speed. So if there's a situation, and this is also why I said they're in order, right? Like, so, historically speaking, these two things are kind of at odds. Um, and so if there's a situation in which, in order to be safe, Rust has to give up a little bit of safety, Rust will do it, but we'll try, yeah, speed, sorry, thank you. Uh, if there's a situation in which uh, we need things to be safe, but we have to give up a little bit of speed, we will do it. But because speed is still a core value, we will try our damnedest to make sure that we can find some other way to make that happen, but every once in a while there's a situation where that's not actually the case. Um, and then finally, I put productivity here, which is a little bit of like a sort of, um, I don't want to say like weasel word exactly. It's like a little hard to define what productivity means. But uh, Rust cares a lot about being a language that is useful to people. And so uh, you'll sort of see this expressed differently in the things Rust doesn't care about later. But basically, like Rust wants to make decisions that will make it be a thing that you want to use Rust. That sentence is terrible. I'm sorry. Uh, but like, programmers need to use a language, and Rust is a language that wants to be used. And there are some languages that don't want you to use them, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get into that. And that's totally fine. Like, again, it's not a judgment about values. It's about your judgment of your values. Um, so, so these are the core things that Rust really cares about. Um, Rust's secondary values, and these are the things that we would like to have but we're willing to give up a lot of the times, are ergonomics. So uh, in order to achieve safety and speed, Rust has some stuff that makes it a little harder to use. Getting ahead of myself. But like, we'll give up those, that ease of use uh, sometimes to achieve those other goals, but we still would really like it to be as easy to use as possible. Um, another one, and this is unfortunate if you've ever used Rust, I'm sure you're not surprised by compile times being a secondary value. The Rust compiler is slow. Uh, it's a problem. We are working on it, but like we care more about the final speed of binaries than we do about making the compiler fast. Like we will always make your program faster if it makes your compile time slower, uh, and that's just what it is. That said, a large part, um, after this talk, I'm about to post the like, proposal for this year's Rust roadmap, uh, and one of the major features of it is like, how are we gonna make the compiler faster? So like, we do care about this, and we wanna get it done, but uh, you know, we give it up maybe a little more than we should even sometimes. And then, uh, this is kind of interesting, correctness is a secondary value, and what I mean by this, this is, Rust really cares that your programs are right, but like, we're not willing to go like, full dependent types proof assistant make sure that your code is right. Like, it should be right, but like, we're not gonna make you prove that it's right. And so that's why it's a secondary value, is because like, we're willing to give up a little bit of correctness sometimes, um, 
in order for, for example, ergonomics. Like, proof assistants are really hard to use, and I, I don't expect that many of you in this room have even used one, let alone are comfortable using one. And so you have to give up a little bit of those kind of correctness tools in order to achieve ergonomics and like productivity. Um, okay, things that Rust does not care about. I think this first one might be a surprise to a lot of you, um, but it's actually in the name. So blazing a new trail in programming language theory, the name Rust evokes a lot of different things, uh, and it actually, there's no one reason why Rust is named Rust. Um, the guy who made it originally, Graydon, used to just come up with new things of why when, whenever someone would ask him, so there's like six different reasons out there. But one of them is, is that like, Rust's programming language theory technology is like, 2000 to 2006 era programming language terminology. Uh, it just happens that most of the languages we use today were made in like 1995, and so Rust seems like it's this like really big conceptual leap forward, but if you talk to like somebody who's trying to get their PhD in PLT, they're gonna be like, Rust is like real boring. Like a lot of the tech that Rust is built on is actually pretty old. Um, and so Rust is not trying to be a research language. We're not trying to push programming language theory forward completely. Some of the people on the language team might disagree with me a little bit. They have PhDs. It's cool. Um, we do do some new stuff, but it's like not a thing we're like trying to do as a goal. Um, secondarily, uh, worse is better. Rust uh, like is not interested in just sort of throwing something out there and hoping it's good enough and iterating. We spend a lot of time trying to get things right. And so on the sort of like, you know, Jersey versus MIT like side of things, we are more on the MIT side of things. Uh, Rust will spend a lot of time iterating on features until they are good, and we are sort of not willing to just kind of like throw stuff out there. And the way that you can see this is in our standard library. Um, Rust has a very small standard library, and that's because we're not totally sure that we have great libraries for things yet. And so we're not just gonna throw like an XML parser in the standard library, unless we think we've got a great XML parsing library, because uh, the standard library is where libraries go to die, uh, and that's no fun for anyone. Um, and so we, we tend towards the correctness side than just sort of the throw something out there kind of side of things. And then a last one, which is kind of interesting for systems languages, supporting certain kinds of old hardware. Um, an example of this specifically is uh, two's complement versus one's complement integers. Uh, if you're a C and C++ programmer, you may know, I hope you know, that uh, the representation of integers is undefined, and uh, that leads to all sorts of fun shenanigans. And that's because C and C++ were developed in an era where a lot of hardware had different implementations of integers, and so you're allowed to pick one's complement, two's complement, or assign magnitude for integers. Um, we basically said, listen, uh, Literally all the hardware that gets made today uses two's complement integers, so we're just gonna assume that you have two's complement integers, and you can use a different language if you are programming a machine from the 70s. And this, is, this hardware support like, is so true. There's actually a paper right now, um, the feature freeze for C++ 2020 just passed, but like the next iteration of C++ uh, 23 might also like, declare that it only supports two's complement hardware, because it just turns out that like, it's been a long time since anyone's made one's complement machines, except for like one company, and everyone's like, come on. Like, uh, so anyway, we're like willing to eschew hardware support for certain kinds of old things in the name of like, we don't have those kind of integer undefined behaviors um, because we're willing to just say it's two's complement, like, that, and that's fine. Um, and so that's a trade-off that we uh, are willing to make. So those are some, some examples um, of our values. Oh no, now I don't know how to go back. Let's see, there we go, cool. All right, so um, a little bit more about values and design. Um, an interesting thing is that uh, you know, it's not just you that has values in the system you're trying to build, it's also your users. Like They have a certain set of values of the things they're trying to accomplish. And so as a programmer, uh, I think it behooves us to like, think about not just the values that we hold, but the values of the people that use our software hold. Um, and that comes with like, you know, as a programmer, you should use tools that align with your values. Um, I really like programming languages and learning new ones, but there are some that I have seen where I'm like, you know what, this language is not for me, so I'm just not gonna use it. Um, and I'm not gonna denigrate any languages by naming them. Um, but like, 
it's, it's true that I would be unhappy if I had to program in some languages, and that's because they value different things than I value, and that's, that's totally chill. There are other people who have different values than me. They can use those languages. They are super happy. That's literally why we have different languages. Like, it's fine. Um, but like, I've had frustrations with tools where I was forced to use something, and I was like, man, this tool sucks. And then I realized it wasn't that the tool sucked, it's that it cared about different things than I cared about. And that like, weirdly made me more OK with using the tool, because I was able to just be like, I understand why this friction is happening, and it made that job easier. Um, and in general, those kind of mismatches can cause those problems. And I find that a lot of programmers arguing on the internet about whether something is great or terrible or awesome or horrible really come down to that person has a certain set of values for the things they create, and they're talking about a thing that cares about completely different things. And uh, that's where a lot of arguments happen. So uh, for more on that, watch Brian's talk. It's great. Um, OK, so uh, when should you use Rust? Before we talk about the specific trade-offs, um, I figured I would put some examples of like when Rust might make sense to you. If you find these values to be true in the software you write, uh, you may want to use Rust. If not, don't. It's cool. Um, there are lots of great languages. So I think that Rust is ideal whenever you need something that's both reliable and performant. Yes, performant is a word. I don't care what you say. Uh, language changes over time. Deal with it. I've had a lot of bad arguments on the internet. I'm really sorry. It's really shaped my worldview in many ways. Uh, there are people who care if you use the word performance, and they will get mad at you, and I'm expecting tweets about it later. Um, so uh, performance is important. Reliability is important. When you need those two things, you might want to look to Rust. It's interesting because a lot of people are like, well, when wouldn't I care about reliability and performance? And like, let's be serious. Think about some systems you built. There's been a lot of them that have not been reliable or performant, right? Like, if there's, there's times in which you are willing to trade away those things, and that's totally cool. Um, the, a lot of the sort of like rewrite it in Rust meme comes from places that have built something in a system that is not necessarily reliable performant and then got to scale and realized like, oh my god, we need reliability and performance. And they rewrote a portion of it in Rust and we're happy. And that's like a really great strategy for managing these kinds of trade offs. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, sometimes you need these things, sometimes you don't need these things, and that's cool. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned with the, the rewrite stuff, like sometimes you don't need those things immediately. Um, so we'll be here. Like it's cool. Go write stuff and other things. Um, all right, so let's talk about some case studies. The first couple of case studies are going to sort of be about the design of Rust itself and trade-offs in the design and the way we approach the design process. And then I'll sort of get more specific. We'll talk about threading models at the end. So this is kind of going from like broad to concrete. Um, so BDFLs versus design by committee. Um, this trade-off involves who is building your system and who gets to make the calls, like who's the decider. Um, one model is the BDFL model, which is the benevolent dictator for life. Uh, they rule over their project with hopefully a velvet fist, not an iron fist. Hope that's not mixing too many metaphors. Um, they need to be benevolent or else you've got a dictator and that's bad. But if they're a benevolent dictator, it's probably good. Um, and a lot of people like this model, and a lot of programming languages are designed this way. Um, the other option is designed by committee, where a bunch of people who are not invested in the system make the decisions. And uh, there's this quote, I forgot about this when I was looking at these slides, a camel is a horse designed by committee. I don't think it's really fair to camels. I also have a pearl camel tattoo. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, there's sort of this like, when you look up the definition for this, they're like, it's a pejorative term for, uh, and so, you know, like a lot of people think like, oh, if something's designed by multiple people, then that has also has chances to really go awry, right? And so we have these two trade-offs. We let one person make all the decisions, and then if they make a bad decision, we're totally screwed, or we make a lot of people make decisions, and when they make bad decisions, we're totally screwed. But like, which one is actually better? And so can we do things differently? And uh, so Rust, uh, didn't ever really truly have a BDFL, but we went from one person makes decisions to lots of people making decisions over time as the project developed. So originally, Rust was a side project by Graydon, and so he got to decide everything because he was the only person working on it. Like, that's just what happens, right? You start a project, you're in charge. Like, woo! Um, but he was always extremely forward that he was not the BDFL, which a lot of people were like, that's a great sign in a BDFL. Uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> And so, uh, so eventually he kind of like gave up his power to a bunch of other people, which even more people wanted him to be at a BFL, because they're like, if you're willing to give it up now, like you're gonna be great. And he was like, this whole thing makes me uncomfortable, no. Um, so we developed uh, the, the Rust core team, and so that became a small group of people whose decision is, was to make decisions about the language. 
Um, but eventually, we ran into issues of scale. I believe that's my next slide. And so uh, we transitioned from having a group of people to having a group of groups of people. So now uh, the Rust project has our core team, which I'm a member of. We also have what used to be called sub-teams and are now just called teams. Um, but like, uh, so for example, I'm a member of the documentation team as well as the core team, so I'm on both. There are some people who are on only one team. Um, and the idea is that all of the teams are actually equally in charge. Rust's core team is like more of a tie-breaking organization at this point than it is a like hierarchical thing. But that's also complicated and weird. I don't want to get into it. We don't really vote, so we don't have ties to break, but like it's fine. Uh, the important part is that like Rust used to have one person in charge, and it had like six people in charge, and now it has about a hundred people in charge. Um, and so we've changed a lot um, as this works out. Um, and the reason this happened is basically due to scale. Um, as the project grew, we ran into limits. So I was on the core team whenever it was the only team, and the problem was is that uh, it was our job to decide on things. And so every week, we'd have a meeting, and we would decide on all the things we need to decide on. And by that, I mean there'd be this big, giant list. We'd get through some of them, and the next week, there'd be even more added onto the list. And so it just started to grow. And people became frustrated that the core team was becoming this bottleneck. And members on the core team were frustrated because like, not every one of those decisions was relevant to every member of the team. And so if you wanted to talk about like variance in our type system, I like read Reddit while those meetings happened. Like, I wasn't paying attention. Um, but I still had to vote, because I was on the team, so like, that's weird and dumb. Um, and then when I was like, I really want to talk about whether we choose British or American English for our documentation standards, like, that was my jam. The people that had the PhDs in type theory were like, yeah, whatever Steve says, that's fine. Um, and so, and it took so long to get through all these decisions that like, people would be like, I've been waiting on a month for you all to make a decision on my pull request. Like, what's going on? And we'd be like, sorry, we got all this stuff to decide. So in order to scale, uh, we decided to sort of like, make more than just the core team. And so uh, you know, that was this like, creative solution to this problem. Um, and you know, that's been helpful. But then that comes with new problem of its own. Because you know, now when you have like, 100 people and like, 15 teams, they all have to like, coordinate. And so recently, uh, I would like to announce that we're uh, about to make our uh, governance team, which is basically like a team team. So its job is to figure out where coordination issues are between the teams and help inner team stuff work. So it's kind of like a team making team. Uh, programmers love recursion. Uh, and so this also means that like, you know, originally like one of the problems with BDFL versus design by committee that people bring up is like the BDFL has a grand vision that he toils over like a, an artist or whatever. And design by committee has like no taste. Um, and so one of the problems is you move to multiple people, you, you lose this cohesion unless you're explicit about these design values, right? So we all have to like agree like what are the principles that we use to make these decisions. And so that's something that we've been getting a little bit better at is communicating to each other like how we make these decisions and why and uh, you know, dealing with those problems. But so I don't want to say that having 100 people run your language is a panacea because it is not. Uh, but it definitely has helped with the bottleneck of like having documentation people decide on language features. Um, okay, uh, second one, stability without stagnation. So uh, let me check time here real quick. All right, so uh, stability, I had an argument on the internet with somebody about what stability meant recently. They're like, you added a new API this release, so it's not stable. Stable means unchanging. And I'm like, oh God. Um, so <laughs> stability means things don't change, but like, if you never change, then you're also not growing. Like growth requires some amount of change. Um, and so how do you like make sure that you're stable enough that your users aren't dealing with like, we changed everything, so now your code doesn't compile. Like, enjoy the new feature. Uh, <laughs> versus like, you know, sorry, we can't fix that bug because it's relied on in production by this large company. Uh, and so this is like a trade-off you have to deal with. Um, and so we want to be able to have change, but we also don't want it to affect people that don't want it, like opt-in change. And so we don't actually think that these two things are inherently at odds. Um, and so there's this blog post called Stability, Stability is Deliverable. I'm going to have a couple little citations from it, but if you want to look it up, it's on the Rust blog. There's the URL. I'm sure you'll type out that URL in the two seconds it takes me to describe this, but you can just Google for this on the Rust blog, and it's like a thing. But this sort of lays out our plan and our approach to stability, and I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds, but um, basically, uh, we don't want to mean that Rust will stop evolving, but we want to release new versions of Rust frequently and regularly, 
And in order for people to be able to upgrade to those new versions, it has to be painless to do so. So our responsibility is to make sure that you never dread upgrading Rust. And if your code compiles on 1.0, it should compile on Rust 1.x without problems. Um, and so uh, this is sort of like continuous integration. So all the rhetoric around like continuous integration, continuous deployment is like if you deploy twice a year and you fear deploy week, if you start deploying every week, you get better at it, right? You get better at what you do. Uh, so if you deploy often, you will be better at deploying. So let's do that. So we kind of approach this with the language. If we uh, release the language often, then we'll do a better job of making sure that we don't break stuff. Because it's not like once a year that we check in with our users if we've broken all their stuff. Um, and so this is the kind of thing we do. And so we actually copied browsers. This basically just says, like, uh, we land stuff on master. We have feature flags. Uh, and then every six weeks, master becomes promoted to beta. The previous beta becomes stable. If you've ever used Chrome or Firefox, you have probably seen this model. Like every six weeks, your browser is like, hey, a new version of the browser came out. Um, we did the same thing with Rust. And uh, that lets us like do these releases, but things don't get off of nightly. Like They don't get into a release until they're explicitly marked as stable. And what that lets us do is it lets us experiment with new features on nightly and actually ship the code and like put it into the, the, the compiler, but that won't affect stable users because you're not allowed to use nightly features when you're unstable. And so this lets you, as a user of Rust, if you want to be involved and try out new features and get goodies while they're still cooking, uh, you can do that by downloading a nightly version of the compiler and trying it out and give us feedback. And if you don't want to deal with that, because that's a pain, then uh, you can use stable and never have to worry about that. And stable becomes really easy to update and all those kind of things. Uh, this says what I just said. I'm not going to read slides to you. So what's the trade-off here? Like, the thing with bending the curve is when you introduce a third thing into your this or that, like, you're also probably introducing a fourth thing that's like, you're giving up something there too, right? So I don't want to always say that this means you get everything. And so this process is a lot of work for us. We have a team for that. It's called the release team. Uh, and also the infrastructure team. They both deal with this problem. So we got two teams working on this. And so we had to put two teams together to work on it. Like that's a trade-off. Um, we also invested a lot in continuous integration because we need to be testing. We actually periodically download every open source package in Rust and try to compile it with the next version of the compiler to just double check we're not breaking your stuff. Um, that's really cool. It also means Mozilla's paying a bunch of money for some servers. Uh, so thank them. Um, we developed a lot of bots. So uh, Boars is our continuous integration bot. It makes sure that everything passes um, the test suite before it lands. Um, this also means that Boars is always the number one of our contributors list because he merges every single pull request. Uh, I got lots of stories about that that are funny, but uh, there's no time, so sorry. Uh, you can ask me about that later. Um, but Bots are awesome. Um, and so basically, this is one of those like our users versus us trade-offs. Like We're willing to put in effort to make things easier for our users. And that is a trade-off that we will almost always take. Uh, and so it is a trade-off, and we pay the price for you. Uh, OK, acceptable levels of complexity. Um, there is sort of two different kinds of complexity. There is inherent complexity, and there's incidental complexity. Inherent complexity is just like, it's actually complicated. And incidental complexity is like, you made it complicated when you have to make it complicated. Um, and so separating out these two things is important because you can't always get inherent complexity to go away because it's inherent, like it's defined sort of in the word. Um, but incidental complexity is the thing that you can fight because it's about you accidentally making things more complicated than you needed to. And so that's like a skill and a thing to like sort of work on. Um, and so, but what's interesting about this is something can be inherently complex for one design, but incidentally complex for another design. Um, and so that values list that you picked earlier can often determine if something is inherent or incidentally complex. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, Alan Perlis is this guy. I don't actually know what he did other than write witty stuff about programming, um, to be honest. But he has this thing called epigrams and programming, and I found several of them I think that are interesting to Russ. And so uh, it's easier to write an incorrect program than to understand a correct one. Uh, a programming language is low level when its programs require attention to the irrelevant. That one's my favorite. Uh, and then finally, to understand a program, you have to become both a machine and the program. Uh, he wrote these in the late 80s, I believe. I'm not totally sure. But I think these all apply to Rust. And what I mean by that is that Rust does want to help you write correct software. And Rust does want you to write fast software. And so 
in order to do that, like we expose a lot more error handling than many languages do, because a lot of stuff can go wrong when you're writing programs, as it turns out. Uh, the network can die in the middle of a connection. Your user can type in something that doesn't make sense. Like all sorts of errors happen. And so uh, we expose those errors many times when other languages just hide them away. Um, this happens in a language design level because we have a type called result that returns from fallible operations. We don't have exceptions. A lot of languages hide a lot of stuff in exceptions, which is where you get that like catch E, like throw all, like, you know, the kind of things where you're just like, yeah, whatever, I have no idea what exceptions this is throwing, so I'm just gonna like catch them all and rethrow it again. Somebody else can deal with it somewhere else. Um, that's not great for correctness, but it is easy to do. Um, and so we've introduced stuff like a question mark operator to help reduce the complexity, but it's still always gonna be there because we want you to be able to handle errors and that's important. And so that's a way in which our design has made something uh, inherently complex. Languages that care less about correctness are able to just be like, yep, throws a bunch of random crap, and that's fine, and that becomes much easier to use, and so they're able to get rid of that uh, stuff, and so it's not inherent for them. Um, and same thing with uh, one way that Rust does safety and speed together, like we achieve those two values at the same time, is by having a really great static type system. Because types are checked at compile time, so they're free. Remember what I said about long compile times earlier? Uh, they're not actually free. But at runtime, they're free. So that's cool. Um, but if you ever used a really strong static type system, you know they're complicated. And that means as a user, Rust is a little more complicated for you to use. But the benefit of what you get out of that is programs that are really fast. Um, and that's cool. But that means that we have this sort of like inherent complexity to achieve our goals, and these things actually matter. If your goals are not to have safety and speed at the same time, to only be fast or only be safe, then like you don't need these complicated type systems and things become a lot easier for your users. Um, and so that's not inherently complex anymore. Um, and uh, this is what I said without the slide. Uh, all right, last case study before I uh, go away. Um, green versus system threads. This is the most complicated, like actual concrete uh, case study I have for you here. Uh, so there's these two different models of threading. There are more of them as well, but for the purposes of this talk, only these two exist. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details that much, but basically system threads are provided by your operating system. They're an abstraction for running code. Uh, you say, hey OS, please run some more code at the same time, and it goes cool. Uh, it doesn't actually run at the same time, but that's a whole separate story. Um, Green threads, however, are an API that's offered by your runtime. And so this is like, a programming language is like, hey, I have this mechanism for running code at the same time. And you're like, cool, I will use that. Sometimes this is called N to M threading because you have N system threads that are running M green threads. And sometimes system threads are called one to one threading because one system thread is one operating system thread. Um, these terms are also incredibly loose and you can argue about them a lot on the internet if you want to. You can argue about a lot of things on the internet if you want to. Uh, okay, so some of the trade-offs involving picking these things are system threads require that you call into the kernel, it's a kernel API, um, and they have a generally fixed stack size, yes, you can tweak it, this is a slide, I'm not putting every last bit of POSIX onto here. Uh, you get eight, megabyte, eight megabytes by default on x86-64 Linux. Green threads, however, because they're run by your program, they have no system calls, so that's cool, no overhead to calling in the kernel, and they have a lot smaller stack size. So for example, a Go routine has currently eight kilobytes of stack. Um, it used to be even smaller, they found out that was too small, they made it a little bigger. Um, so from these set of trade-offs, it looks like you always want green threads. Like, why would you ever use system threads? These are just better. It's because it's only one slide, I got more. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the, like, with the way Rust development changed, sometimes your values change over time. So Rust was before 1.0 for five whole years, and so originally, even though Rust had the same design goals and like values, it expressed them very differently. Um, and so originally, Rust was actually much more similar to Erlang than C++, which is kind of a little weird. Um, it was awesome, but weird. Uh, and so it provided only green threads, because that's what Erlang does, and as the previous slide showed you, obviously you would pick green threads in every situation. Um, but over time, Rust got lower and lower level, and we were able to commit more to our performance goals by doing shenanigans. Um, and so we had to sort of reevaluate this choice. Uh, this was such a contentious like, change, there were people threatening to fork the language over it, actually. Um, just a whole other story I don't have time for. Uh, so the argument goes like this. You're supposed to be a systems programming language, but you don't provide access to the operating system's API? What does, what does that even mean? And we're like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then also, the downside of green threads, because you have these small stacks and they're different stacks, if you want to call into C, you have to switch to the regular operating system stack. Uh, and so that has a cost, 
Um, and that performance is like totally at odds with our previous performance stated goal as well, right? So we tried to bend the curve and we failed. Uh, what if we had a unified API to let you pick? Do you get green threads or do you get system threads? Whichever one you want. You write your code one way. They're just threading models, right? So you spin up a new thread. It doesn't need to be a green thread or a system thread. It's fine. So let's do both. So we had this lib native versus lib green. And uh, you pick the one you wanted in your program. And people would write libraries that would be abstract and didn't care about the threading models. You just get to do whatever you want. Everything would be wonderful. The problem is that this gave you the downsides of both and the advantages of neither. Uh, so. That was a problem. Uh, it turns out that our green threads weren't very lightweight. They were actually pretty heavy. And uh, there's some other things. I have some lists here. I'm not going to read all this to you. But basically, uh, some things only made sense for one model and not the other model. But both models had to support both things. So that was awkward. Um, it was a problem with I.O. because like, only some stuff worked properly across both things, which is an implementation issue. Um, embedding Rust. So if you want to write Rust on an embedded system, you'd have to say, I never support the green threading runtime, but the whole point is you're supposed to be agnostics. Like, how's that go? And then finally, like, we committed to maintaining both things. So like, you just had to be good enough to maintain both of them. And that's like, a really big burden. So we eventually decided to kill it. And uh, that was bad. And so we realized that we were able to commit to some values more than others. So the answers were different. There are other languages who only give you green threads. That is awesome for them. They have different values than we do. Um, and so you should take time as you're designing a system, too, to check back in with yourself and say, hey, have my values changed since I originally made this decision? Because maybe that decision I made was a bad one, and I need to reevaluate it. Um, and so yeah, now we only have uh, system threads in the standard library. But uh, I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, so because we don't have a runtime, uh, it means that you can write your own runtime and include it if you want. So there is a, uh, two different packages. One is called Rayon, and one is called Tokyo. And they are both ways of doing sort of green threads for different kinds of workloads. Don't have time to get into it. We can talk about it afterwards if you'd like. Um, there's also trade-offs here as well. For example, uh, now you have to know about Rayon and or Tokyo, and you have to pick the right one to use. So that's complicated. And then finally, what happens if people made like six packages to do this instead of two? Um, so there's some downsides, but I don't have any more time. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, the three things you should take away from this are trade-offs are kind of an inherent aspect of our domain. But if you think outside the box, you can sometimes have your cake and eat it too. And uh, you should use Rust when you really care about something being both robust and fast. Thank you so much.